Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free Microsoft 7680 certification training course. This module is on Branch Cache. I'm James Messer. In this module, we're going to talk about Branch Cache. We're going to talk about distributed cache mode versus hosted mode. We'll talk about the network infrastructure requirements to get Branch Cache even up and running in your environment. We'll talk about configuring some of the settings for a Branch Cache. And finally, how you can look at managing the certificates for Branch Cache in your environment. Branch Cache is a capability that was added to Windows 7 and Windows Server 2008 R2 so that you could cache information locally that normally would have to come across very, very slow wide area network connections. When you're over those slower WAN links, transferring a single file can take a long time. And if somebody else at your branch office needs access to the same file, you don't want them to have to go back to the WAN and transfer that same file back again. Instead, you would love to have a copy of it locally, a cached copy that you could access on your local network and not spend the time and the bandwidth having to transfer that file across the link. In the past, we've had to use additional hardware to do this. There have been third-party products, some that worked well, some that did, that did not. And what Microsoft thought they would do is integrate this into the operating system, make this just an integral part of what the OS did. This works with Windows 7 in conjunction with Windows Server 2008 R2. So this is relatively new. It's not going to work with your Windows XP workstations. It's not going to work with other Windows operating systems. It's only specific to Windows 7, and it's accessing services that are on Windows Server 2008 R2. That's a very specific set of circumstances there that you want to be sure that you're using those to be able to do the branch cache options. This is very, very seamless to the end user. The end user doesn't even know it's happening. You've already made configuration changes on their computer, and you've told it to use the branch cache. And at that point, it's using the same protocols, the same network connectivity, the same methods that it would normally use for authentication. And it's something the user doesn't even know is happening. They just notice that things are faster. Sounds pretty good. It's also something that only kicks in if your latency to that remote server exceeds 80 milliseconds. So round trip time starts to be slower and slower. You'll start to see branch cache take advantage of that slow response time and be able to now kick in and start caching things locally. This is also something that's seamless to the end user. You don't have to change protocols. You don't have to change the way people access information. Use exactly the same authentication methods that you use. It looks exactly the same to the end user. But instead, the information is being cached locally. It's all completely automatic and very, very seamless. Branch Cache also keeps track of how your network's doing. If the network performance is pretty good, it's going to work normally. But if your latency, your round trip to go from end to end happens to exceed 80 milliseconds, and on very slow WAN links it certainly will, then Branch Cache automatically kicks in. So this is nothing the user has to turn on and off. There's nothing the user has to reconfigure. Completely seamless and automatic in the way that it works. For branch cache to work properly, you're going to have to have the right components. And if you're using a hosted environment, we'll talk about hosted versus distributed in just a moment. But if you're going to have a hosted cache server at your location, you will need one at every remote branch office. That's something important. There's additional resources required there. If you're running in a distributed mode, that means you will not have a local server at your branch office. It's one that uses Windows 7 in a distributed environment. This hosted cache server needs to be Windows Server 2008 R2. So that R2 is pretty important. You need that version of Windows Server 2008. And you also need to create SSL certificates on that remote server that are also trusted by the Windows 7 users. That's pretty important. Usually when you're in a really, really large environment, especially one that might be using this cached server functionality, you already have an infrastructure of certificates that you've built. But if not, you'll need to make sure that you're building with some certificate authorities that are pushed down to the end user workstations so that they trust the certificates that you've built for these 2008 R2 servers. All of this caching information that's going back and forth is all encrypted between the end user and the cached server. And that's why these certificates are so important. And that's why it's important for your end, work, end user's workstations to automatically trust the certificates that you've built for those servers. 
You also need Windows 7 as your client and only Windows 7 Ultimate or Windows 7 Enterprise. This does not work with Windows 7 Professional and lower. You may have to import those certificate authorities that you've built. One easy way to do this is through group policy. Very common to take certificates that you've built and automatically push them out to your workstations using group policies. There's two methods of having branch cache operate. One is called a distributed mode, and the other one's called a hosted mode. In a distributed mode, you do not have a branch cache server, a caching server, sitting at your remote site. This is our remote site on the left side with a couple of workstations. There's a wide area network in between, and maybe there's a file server at the main location that has some files on it that we need to work with. Well, the first thing that's going to happen is your local workstation is going to send a message to that server saying, can I have that file that's out there at that remote site? And instead of sending that file back, your local workstation is sent along with that. By the way, I can do caching along with this. If you have, have that file there, I might want to see if it's local first. So what your server is going to do is not send the file back. It's going to send a content identifier that is an identifier for that particular resource, in this case, a file. And it's going to send that back to the, the workstation that asked for it to begin with. That workstation then is going to send a message locally at, the, at that local location. Does anybody here already have this file? You might have downloaded it previously, and I'd like to know if you happen to have it. If you don't get a response from that, then you know you have to pull that file back from the main site. Nobody has the file, then you're going to have to go all the way back and please send me a copy of that file. This is for the first time going across, and we'll transfer that file across that very slow WAN link. And at that point, that local computer is going to cache that file locally on the hard drive of that Windows 7 machine. That's going to be pretty important because there may be somebody else at that location who says, can I have that file? And it sends the message back to the server at the, at the home office saying, could I get a, that file as well? And that server sends back the content identifiers again. And that second station does exactly what the first station did, which was ask other people at the same place, hey, does anybody local have this file? This is the content identifier for the file. Do you, does anyone else out there, have you already gone through the process of transferring it? In this particular case, someone has, that first workstation has, and says, well, here's a copy of that file that I've cached out there. It's a very, very simple way now to take all of those different machines that you have in that environment running Windows 7 and distribute them without having a local server at that remote site. In a hosted mode of branch cache, it works similarly, except there's a caching server that is local at each branch office. The process is almost identical, though. You have a machine that says, I would like a copy of that file. And it says that I can do branch cache just in case. So that machine is going to send information back that says, here's the content identifier for that file. That machine then says, does anybody else have that file? And it's going to ask specifically to the caching server rather than ask everybody else that happens to be at our local site. And the caching server is going to know pretty quick whether it has the file or not. It says, sorry, I don't have that file. At that point, your first machine says, I'm going to go get the file then. It's going to send that message off to the file server and say, we're not going to cache this. Just send me the file now. And your file server is going to take that file and send it across the network to that computer. Since that computer knows that that file was not cached originally, it creates a copy of that file and sends it off to your caching server where it's also going to sit. And, and usually you have a lot of disk space on these servers. This becomes a central repository for all of these files that are being cached. That becomes pretty important when another computer at your location also would like a copy of that file and goes through the same process. Sends a message to the file server back at the corporate office saying, can I get a copy of that file? I can cache, use a branch cache if possible. This, uh, this file server will send back the content identifier of that file. And that second machine knows that it can ask the local branch cache server if it has that file available. And if it does have the file, can you make that file available to me? And then the branch cache server will simply send that a copy of that file also to that second machine. Since it was cached locally, did not have to traverse that slower WAN connection, simply took advantage of the cache that was built earlier by the first workstation.
in our previous examples, we had to configure those client workstations to know that we could work in a branch cache configuration and whether there was a hosted branch cache server there. There are some settings under group policy, under computer configuration policies, administrative templates under network and branch cache that you'll want to look at. You can also see at the command line how you might want to set some of these things up. The netsh command that we've used previously also has branch cache commands associated with it where we can set up service modes for distributed or set service mode for a hosted client and specify a hosted server that we might want to use. Whenever you start configuring these at the command line, one of the things that opens up are some rules in your Windows firewall. Because often, your branch cache server and other devices are connecting back to you to be able to open up that flow of communication to send those cached files, you need to have the Windows firewall open so that it can receive those messages from those external devices. You also might want to look at services running on your computer. Once you set up these group policies or set this up at the command line, there has to be a special service running called the peer dist service. This is the peer distribution service that allows you to act as a peer for all of these different distributions that are occurring, you should see that the service status is started and the startup type is set to manual. Let's review some of these topics relating to branch cache. Our first question, what is required at a remote site to support branch cache in hosted mode? That's the special characters, the special word there, hosted mode. We're going to need a server to be able to cache these. And not just any server, of course. We need Windows Server 2008 R2. Other versions of Windows Server will not operate in branch cache mode. You have to have 2008 R2. Our second question, which Windows 7 editions support branch cache? Well, there were only two, and they were the highest end Windows editions. You need Windows 7 Ultimate and Windows 7 Enterprise. And our last question, what are the two methods of configuring branch cache on a Windows 7 client computer? We have done this both at the command line and at the GUI. And you saw that we used group policy to be able to set policies for everybody. Or we could also use the netsh command if we'd like to do this in a batch mode or just would like to do this at the command line on a computer. Well, that covers our requirements for this branch cache module. We've looked at the distributed versus hosted mode, the requirements that we need to have branch cache work on our network, how we can configure those settings, and things we need to think about to manage the certificates that are used by branch cache. If you'd like to see any of our absolutely free Microsoft videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards and much more, you can visit our website at ProfessorMesser.com. 